Good morning. Morning. Good morning. Oh, and in case I don't see you, good afternoon, good evening, and good night. This is my boomstick. Here's Johnny. Are you not entertained? Are you not entertained? Righteous! Righteous! Yeah! I love the smell of napalm in the morning. Good morning, Vietnam! Houston, we have a problem. The first rule of Fight Club is you do not talk about Fight Club. All right, all right, all right. Welcome back, everyone, to Those Film Nerds Podcast. My name is Will Spalding, and as always, I'm joined by my co-host and good friend, Sam Deerberger. Sam, how's it going? Uh, pretty lame intro today, Will. You know, I was thinking because of our, uh, because of our, our uh, podcast uh, episode today, or what we're going to be talking about, I figured I'd keep it a little drier. That was a okay. conscious decision. I want all of the fans to know that. Okay, that's fair. That's fair. I just kind of expected a few more adjectives, but that's fine. Well, I'll get over it. <laughs> I'll, bra- I'll brainstorm this week. Don't worry. <laughs> so, um, here we are. It is late September, and we've um, we have not come across any new releases that are of interest to us i suppose there's nothing uh, there's nothing out there um, so, so what is what does that mean sam what what uh what movie are we talking about today you know we figured why not let's review casablanca today casablanca city of hope and despair located in french morocco in north africa the meeting place of adventurers fugitives criminals refugees lured into this danger swept oasis by the hope of escape to the americas but they're all trapped for there is no escape against this fascinating background is woven the story of an imperishable love and the enthralling saga of six desperate people each in casablanca to keep an appointment with destiny casa blanca man this uh we don't want to get into it too much before we get to our review, but uh, this is a movie. This is this is a film. This is a this is a film. Uh, oh, uh, tangentially related, um, the any movie trailer pre nineteen ninety is kind of terrible because <laughs> it reveals so much about the movie, like. So much. Um, and that's true for any movie. It's just the way the studios did it back in the day, I suppose. Um, they had to get, they had to get uh, people out to, out to the movies. If, they, if people didn't know what it was about, there's no way they were going to go. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, now no, we, they now, just blindly walk into theaters. I mean, my God, we watched Eurovision a few months back and without, without any warning... And we just we just went right in there. No uh, no regrets either, right? No, no regret either. I, you know, I'm a better person for some Eurovision, the fire saga of two people who <laughs> live in the country. I think that's we're not going to reveal anymore. We're not going to reveal anymore. No, um, go check out that episode because <laughs> it's 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 funny. Um, but yeah, today we thought we would do a retrospective review on Casablanca because. Um, it, it, it is a masterpiece yes. and, um, I said to Will, I thought, you know, we've been doing all these new streaming releases and, you know, a lot of you, a lot of you listeners, I would assume either actually watch the movies or you just are fine with spoilers and are like, okay, I'm never going to watch this movie. Um, and listen to the episode anyway, which we appreciate it either way. Like, a listen's a listen. But we figured we should give you guys some sort of, uh, like, classic movie reviews so that you can watch some of the classics and you're not sitting through Eurovision every week. Not that we're watching Eurovision every week necessarily, but, you know. Some oh, no, I do. I do. I know you do. I, I rewatch watch every week. Uh, it, it gives you perspective. Yeah, things. exactly. Um, yeah, 
So we thought we would start out with Casablanca. Uh, if you like this idea of doing classic movies uh, with a little more frequency, then let us know. Uh, we will continue the new review, obviously. Um, but I, I would like to, I for one would like to mix these in as well. Absolutely. And by classics, we don't have to mean only movies that predate 1950, but, uh, it could be something from the nineties too. Uh, so it doesn't have to be, they could be modern classics like we did inception. That was fun. Uh, it could be, it could be anything like that. So yeah, we, I think, I think Sam and I are on the same page here. Hopefully, uh, hopefully the audience also is. But yeah, we definitely want to mix uh, some more uh, retrospectives in with the usual um, streaming movie because of <laughs> because theaters don't exist anymore. Theaters theaters are burning down, um, and uh, communication has been rather dry in terms of the email or the Instagram DMs. So we're at the point now where if you if you if you give us a film that we deem worthy of classic title, we will do a review on it. Like we will do an entire episode on it. Absolutely. Um, until we get absolutely inundated with requests, which I doubt will happen anytime soon, but one can hope. Uh, <laughs> so uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, those film nerds at gmail.com. Let us know. Absolutely. But uh, with that being said, that's, that's all we're going to say about Casablanca for now before we get into the actual review. Because we want to talk about some movie news. And I know we have, uh, we have one big one, so I'll save that. But I guess I'll just talk by saying uh, many more movies have been delayed again. I mean, this, isn't, this shouldn't be news at this point, but it is. Yep. Uh, so Death on the Nile, the Kenneth Branagh sequel to... Uh, to Murder on the Orient Express, which I know both of us are excited for, uh, yes. got delayed. Uh, West Side Story, the Steven Spielberg remake of the 1960 Best Picture winner, uh, got delayed till next year, actually. It got delayed on 365 days. We'll have to wait for that one. And then you know, D Disney mostly just pushed all of their stuff. Other studios are following suit. I think the whole Tenet experience, experiment was a failure. So we, we will have to wait. We'll continue to have to wait. Um, and I'm putting the over-under on uh, movies not being really in theaters till December, maybe even January. Oof. You know, as, as the weeks go by, I'm becoming increasingly appreciative of the audacity of Tenet to really go out on a limb, even though it was a tremendous failure in the box office. Good for them. They Good did for it. them. You, you can't, can't fault them for it. Uh, you know, Mul Mulan definitely should have been that because that would yes. have drove more people out. Uh, but good for Warner Brothers and good for Christopher Nolan. Yeah, yeah. I mean, meanwhile, meanwhile, Marvel is just holding back on Black Widow like a, like a, uh, like a weakling. Um, so yeah. we'll see. We'll see. Um, real it's quick. I, I wanted to mention just a couple of upcoming movies that are in the works. Yeah. That, let's hear it. Um, okay. First of all, Henry Cavill. Cable. I don't watch I, Cavill. I, I don't watch Cable. superhero movies. He's playing Sherlock Holmes in a, a, a Netflix original film called Enola Holmes, which uh, focuses on Sherlock's younger sister, played by Millie Bobby Brown of Stranger Things fame, as she sets off to solve her own mystery regarding the disappearance of her mother, Eudoria, played by Helena Bonham Carter. Hmm. Um, how do we feel about this casting, Will? Uh, so I know Enola Holmes is out on Netflix now. Maybe we'll do an episode on it next week. We'll see. Possibly, yeah, sure. Uh, I'm not familiar with the actress who plays Enola Holmes, uh, the younger sister to Sherlock. But, uh, you know, I like uh, Helen Bottom Carter. Uh, 
I wish he would stop doing movies with Johnny Depp, but I, I mean, I wish Johnny Depp would stop doing movies. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I like Henry Cavill. All right. I'm not sure. I mean, he was super, he was really fun to watch in, uh, in mission impossible six, uh, fallout. He was super entertaining in that. Not, yeah. not sure how much charisma he has to play a, a very charismatic role such as Sherlock Holmes, but uh, yeah, yeah, you know, I don't, I don't mind this. What do you think? Well, see, I, I love Sherlock Holmes, as in like the original stories by Arthur Conan Doyle. Coincidentally, um, uh, the Enola Holmes is based on a book. Uh, and the author was actually sued by Arthur Conan Doyle's estate um, over publishing Sherlock Holmes as a character in the story. Um, but uh, most, it looks like most of the Sherlock Holmes stories exist within the public domain today. Um, but that's, that's kind of interesting because the other thing is that Sherlock Holmes has been portrayed on film the most times out of any character ever. Really? Uh, yes. More than James Bond. More than James Bond. Interesting. He's been performed. I don't know if there's a number here. I think it's. I want to say it's Sherlock Holmes, then Dracula, then James Bond. Wow, that surprises me. That's good. Good for Sherlock. Yeah, isn't that good weird? To see something go go Sherlock's way. It's good. It's good to hear that. 254 times. Holy smokes. That's, uh, that's a few. That's wild. That's I can wild. name three right now. That's it. No, wait. I can name four. Well, you got the best one off the top of your head, right? Uh, Will Ferrell? Yeah. Will Ferrell. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Glad we're on the same page. John C. Riley is Dr. Watson is unparalleled. Uh, yeah. Yeah. No, we're on the same page. Uh, <laughs> okay, good. Good. <laughs> Give me some water. Um, you, then you got so Hen Henry Cable now I suppose that's another one uh, RDJ Robert Downey Jr. I know he's played him yep yep uh, Benedict um, Cumberbatch Benedict Cumberbatch indeed I, I couldn't tell you anyone else um, I've listed four out of 250 <laughs> that's not bad there is an excellent series um, I think it's a BBC series from like it the, it's a mini series from the like eighties though, and it's like like the most faithful to the books uh, and short stories of Sherlock Holmes. Um, Ian McKellen, Christopher Lee, uh, who else we got? Ian Richardson, Michael Caine. Christopher Plummer, Roger Moore, uh, John Cleese, Jonathan Price. Uh, um, and I think that's everyone of note, but that is a lot. That is. Uh, those are some big names right there. That's interesting. That's very interesting. Isn't that wild? Well, what, uh, what other other upcoming movies you have or is that it before we move on to our big movie news segment of the week um do i have anything else oh yes other thing that i'm quite excited for i just read this tonight uh david harbour from stranger things brendan fraser oh boy have joined a steven soderbergh heist film that already includes Don Cheadle and John Hamm. Oh boy. Oh boy. How do we feel about this? Where do I start? I love Steven Soderbergh. Yep. Uh, he, I think he's great. I like Don Cheadle. I like, I really like John Hamm. Um, yeah. I like Oh crap! Who? What was the first name he said? Not Brendan Fraser. Um, David Harbor. David. I Harbour. like David Harbor. I think he makes bad choices, but I like him. 
Mm-hmm. But Brendan Fraser needs to not be an actor. Is that is that that's fair to say? I mean, when was the last time Brendan Fraser did a movie? I don't know, and I don't want to know. I I can't believe in the early 2000s we thought Brendan Fraser was going to be a movie star. Someone cast him as the lead guy in a big franchise, the Mummy franchise, obviously, and was like, this guy's got it. I don't... Just, Brendan just, Fraser. Brendan Fraser did a movie in 2019, two movies in 2019 called The Poison Rose and The Line of Descent. Um, those sound like great movies. Prior to that, he was in The Nut Job mm. in 2014. Yeah, and uh, yeah, he had a pretty steady career before that. It's kind of bizarre how he just fell off the map a little bit because well, during. Uh, Enough about Brennan Fraser. I mean, he's just he, uh, he's just weird, weird he's career. A, he's a weird guy. I think uh, Steven Soderbergh. I trust Steven Sp- Soderbergh, especially with the heist movie. I mean, the Ocean series is obviously classic. Logan Lucky from 2017 is an underrated gem. Yeah. So I didn't yeah. know about this, and I'm excited now. Ray Liotta will also be involved. Ooh, <laughs> I can see Ray um, Liotta. Uh. My brother, my brother said to me earlier this year that after watching Marriage Story, that Ray Liotta has the eyes of the devil. He does have creepy eyes. You are right. He, he has some scary, scary eyes. Um, but anyway, with that, that's all I have. Let's let, let's move on to the the news we've been kind of neglecting to talk about. Yeah. Th- so this came out. What would you say, Sam? Two weeks ago. Yeah, something like that. I, I, w- I was going to bring it up last week. I wanted to let it sit a little longer. But uh, it's it's some Academy Award news. Um, and this doesn't – this what I'm about to say does not take effect until 2024. Uh, so the next few years, this does not, does not affect at all. But the Academy Awards released a new rule for the best – well, I should say a new rule in order to qualify movies for the award of Best Picture. So it only it only applies to Best Picture, um, but it's it's a way for it to be qualified for Best Picture. And I guess I'll just go over the rule real quick, and then and then we'll talk about it if that's all right with you. Yeah. So there's four categories that the Oscars or four standards are what they're, they are calling them. And you have to hit two of four of these. And I should preface that this is, these four standards are made to, uh, how, what, what would you say they're made to do? Increase diversification inside Hollywood? Sure, yeah, yeah, that's fair. Which sounds like a great idea to me. It's just the way they did it is odd. Who is doing it is odd. How they're doing it is odd. Everything is odd about it to me. So you have to hit two of the four, which is equally weird because these are so easy. These standards are so easy to hit. Like this should not be an issue at all. So I'll just go through the standards. So you have to hit two of four of these again. So standard A uh, is on screen representation and narratives. So to achieve standard A, the film must meet one of the following. And then there's three things they have to hit. Uh, lead or significant supporting actors has to be someone of uh, a minority, uh, has to be, uh, so that's the first one. Then the second one is, has to have 30% of the characters need to be uh, from a minority LGBTQ, women or people with physical disabilities, or the third option, Uh, The main storyline has to do with something with those three or four groups of people as well. So you just have to hit one of those to hit standard A. And keep in mind, you don't even have to hit standard A to to fill the requirements. You can either hit standard B, C, or D as well. So moving on to B, uh, to to achieve the following, for standard B, you have to hit one of three as well, one of three categories. And it's creative leadership and project team is the, the standard. 
Uh, so you have to have two of the following people in uh, creative leadership roles, such as director, composer, cinematographer, makeup, producers, uh, editors, hairstylists, all that kind of thing. You have to have two of those be a woman, LGBTQ, or a minority, or uh, you have to have six crew members be of those four groups as well. So that's like someone that does the sound on set or someone that is an assistant or something like that, or 30% of the total crew. That's standard B. Standard C is uh, you have to achieve, um, essentially you have to have interns inside of your studio that are uh, a woman, that are women, um, minority or LGBTQ, or standard D, representation in marketing, publicity, and distribution. So you have to have women, people of, uh, or people in minorities, or LGBTQ in your like marketing and pub publicity and distribution. So you have to hit two of the four of those, which this seems like the easiest thing ever to hit. I can't imagine any studios in recent times have not had women, people of color, or LGBTQ people on set. Like, I have to assume every movie made in the past few years has hit these requirements. Does that exactly. make sense? Right, absolutely. Uh, so what, what, what are your thoughts on this? I, I've rambled. Uh, I think this is incredibly stupid. Um, <laughs> uh, it's always been... Hollywood has always been a industry of emotion, obviously, because they're, they're movies, they're movies, and especially the Academy, because the Academy rewards uh, emotional dramas, specifically uh, with the best picture category. Um, my problem with this is that, well, first of all, I think um, that movies – as a result of this will grow maybe slightly worse over time uh, simply because uh, when you're hiring on the basis of race or, uh, or sex or uh, gender identity or sexual orientation um, rather than sheer talent, then obviously things are going to get skewed. Um, but the my, other problem my, my the, thing with what you just said right there sam is that yeah hollywood has been hiring people in these four categories forever it's not like that like women are on set people of race are on set or people of yes non, like it, it's not like the oscars are changing anything here yeah well no but that's that's because that's why i say slightly um Simply because your your number one priority now, if you're making an emotional drama film that you think is best picture caliber, your number one priority is to make it fit within the Academy standards. So you have to get into movie theaters. You have to now hire these uh, these quotas uh, to make sure that it, it it fits within the it fits within the standards rather than focusing on making a great movie and then uh dealing with whether or not you get best picture because art uh in my opinion art should never be uh solely motivated uh by winning a best picture i think the best best picture winners didn't have a best picture win in mind when it was being made they were they were just trying to make great art uh, yeah and that's my number one thing um the other the other issue is kind of um a little i guess you could go down the rabbit hole a little bit with this but uh specifically dealing with race um you know what counts as minority like if it, i mean if someone is like an eighth black do they count like do you do you do you do you 
do you let them in? Do you let someone yeah. um, has been here their entire lives, had a very privileged upbringing, uh, and is a really talented filmmaker? Do you prioritize that? Like, you know, it just seems it just seems wrongheaded. Uh, I think a better policy would be something like you know, um, instituting standards for people who are actually economically underprivileged, uh, regardless of their race, um, and uh, try to give them an opportunity in the industry, something like that. Um, but I just, I don't think it's the Academy's role to, um, to, to be making decisions like this, but it's the Academy, what it wants, you know. I think that's, those are my two biggest things, is that one, I don't know why the Academy is doing this. I don't, I don't know. I don't know why they feel it's their responsibility. I get, like you said, they can do what they want. I mean, it's not like anyone's going to stop them, but that just feels odd to me. And the rules they set, I can't stress this enough, are so easy to hit. I've done reading on this and like of movies made in the past few years, like I, it's like two that have not hit this, this quota. Yeah. By, by the Academy's rules that have set in place. And that's of every movie, like, these, this is so easy to hit that it will not change anything. That's, yeah. I don't think that's the Academy's point. It's, I think it's almost them just making a statement just to say like, hey, we're behind this. I just don't know why this was the statement, if that makes sense. Yeah, well, I mean, as if it wasn't already clear, right? Like, um, what what is one in the last few years? Uh, uh, we have we have Moonlight. That's a that is a black protagonist who is also a member of the LGBTQ community. We have The Shape of Water with a uh, with a Woman female and... lead, a female lead. Uh, I think and a foreign director and a foreign director who is of uh, Hispanic descent. Um, Green Book uh, with a black and gay um protagonist and then we have parasite which is a completely south korean film uh everyone involved was south korean like i don't and you know the academy seems to be doing just fine without these standards so i i, I mean i would agree with you like these standards are clearly just kind of the academy trying to virtue signal saying that they support racial justice or or, or whatnot um simply by putting standards into place as if that's solving racism or something like that. Um, I just, I just disagree with that strategy completely. Um, but uh, one more thing regarding this, Will. Yeah, go ahead. I'd like to ask you, do you think that this will affect the validity of the Oscars going forward? And by that, I mean, will people take, oh, this film won best picture, like let's say in 15 years. Mm. this film won best picture in 2028 do you think people will take that as seriously i think um i think that'll always be loomed over its head but no because i seriously think people will forget about this rule because it because it plays no significance in in how the movies are made because most movies are already hitting this standard. I mean, we just listed the past four best picture winners and just by the cast alone, all of, all of them would be qualified. And we, yep. we didn't even look into um, the rest of the crew and the studio itself. And so, no, I, I don't think anyone looks at these any different. I, th that's why I'm just confused why the Academy is doing this. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that's fair. That's fair. Um, I think that for me personally, I've, I've always kind of felt this coming, this idea of the Academy wanting to put in formal standards because before it was no secret that the Academy favored films with, with, um, with minorities, um, uh, in every sense, racially, sexually, whatever, um, Absolutely. Uh, and that's why that's, that's, you know, a lot of movies that we consider Oscar bait specifically in the 2010s uh, featured these um, 
these types of characters and these types of stories. Right. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's important. And, um, well, yeah, let's just go through the past 10, I suppose. We, we had the King's speech, which is about, uh, you know, the King of England and a disability he has. Mm -hmm. Uh, then you had the artist after that, which is a black and white silent film. Well, that's very Oscar bait, obviously. Yep. Argo is, Argo is not really, um, per se. I mean, it's about getting people out of a bad situation. 12 Years a Slave is completely that. I mean, it's, it's an epic story about someone being freed or getting free from slavery. Yep. Yep. Birdman is, I mean, directed by, a, a, uh, I think Alejandro Gonzalez and Arito is from Mexico. And I mean, the, the cast is mostly white, but and then spotlight is about uncovering, um, problems inside the Catholic church. <laughs> we'll just say that. Problems is a bit of a euphemism, but yeah, <laughs> that's a bit of an understatement. Um, and then from there, you have Moonlight, Shape of Water, Green Book, and Parasite. We've already gone over those. But, like, eight out of ten of those were easily, like, the main character or the director was part of these minorities that were right. women and LGBTQ and uh, 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 different races. And, like, that's, I don't know. It's just, I don't know what the Oscars are doing here. But I guess it doesn't really matter because they have already done it. I, I guess so. I guess so. Um, and um, I think I think you are right, ultimately. I think people will eventually forget. I would like to see, um, you know, a different award, kind of a different award show kind of coexist with the Oscars. Like, I don't know. The Golden Globes are good, but the Golden Globes are not taken as nearly seriously. I yeah. just like something to coexist with the Oscars, uh, wouldn't you? I I, to kind of, I wish the Globe you know, was that. It just doesn't have the relevance like the Oscars do. Yeah, yeah. I like how the Globe like the Globes like breaks it up between categories of like comedy versus drama. I think that's great. Yeah, yeah. It gets more. It gets more. I mean, that's ultimately you want more people um, of minority descent or um, a sexual minority to be um, in film. It's like, get more awards. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's know. what you want to do, too, is you want to celebrate the movies, the great movies of the year, yeah. right? Yeah. You know, you, you have more opportunities for awards. Then you, have, then you need to hire more people. More movies are being made. Mm -hmm. uh, more people get recognition. Like, that's the way to do it. Um, it's not like everyone dreams of winning Best Picture. Uh, just because you're a, you're a sound person working on Eurovision, I don't, I don't know if your dream is to win best picture. It might be, but you know, maybe a golden globe. I'm not saying Eurovision will win a golden globe, but you know, someone in that vein, you know, maybe all you want is a golden globe or something. Uh, yeah, that's fine. You know, well, we've rambled about this for too long. Should we, uh, should we talk about some, uh, the movie of the week? Yeah, let's do it. I know a good deal more about you than you suspect. I know, for instance, that you're in love with a woman. It's perhaps a strange circumstance if you both should love the same woman. There we go. I mean, abrupt transition, Casablanca. but uh, we're talking about Casablanca. I mean, that's why, that's why we're here. This is why we're here. And... Uh, I suppose uh, this was your idea. You you started off. Oh, well, Casablanca um, is one of those movies that you always hear about, um, specifically if you've never seen it. Um, I had always I had always heard about it, um, and I was like, "Yeah, it's an old movie. Is it really that good?" You know that whole thing. And then you watch it, and you're like, "Holy crap! This is actually great!" Like, it lived up to the hype. Yeah, one hundred percent. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. Um, so there was that, and um, 
yeah, Casablanca, man. Um, how do we, how do we, how do we approach this? I don't, I don't, I don't know how to approach it. Um, some would say, um, even if you don't think, even if it's not one of your favorites, it's one of those movies that you could, you could call a perfect film. Yeah. In its own way. Absolutely. Like it's, it's everything it, it cracks up to be. Um, I know, uh, I know I've told you this, but Casablanca is possibly objectively the greatest movie ever made. Um, not saying it's my favorite because it isn't, yeah. but yeah. it's so technically sound. It's aged incredibly well, which doesn't always occur. That is true. Um, that is true. Yeah, it holds up super well. And everything about it just feels perfect. So when you say masterpiece or one of the best films ever made, we really do mean that. Yeah. And, you know, maybe, maybe we should just uh, break it down kind of part by part. Uh, sure. And this sure. is, this is, um, what is this? Nearly 80 years old, 78 years old right now. So I, I think, we're just if spoilers come up, they come up. So <laughs> that's fair. That's fair. Spoiler well, alert for the seventy-eight-year-old movie. Um, actually, wait, it's eighty-eight. Eighty-eight years old. I think. Unless Isn't I can't that crazy. That's that's nuts. That's nuts, man. But uh, yeah. So I guess let's let's just start by uh, our two leads. Uh, Humphrey Bogart and Ingmar Bregman. I think that's how you pronounce her last name. Bergman, yeah. Is it Bergman? Okay. Yeah. Um, some would argue this is one of the greatest romances of all time, and I, I think they sell it quite well. I mean, it seems like they're really in love when, they, when they're with each other. Yeah. Um, and Humphrey Bogart is, is such a great talent. Yes. He really is incredible. He's so fun to watch on screen. Yeah, I mean he 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 is kind of a typecast, but I mean, in by that logic, this is the role he was born for. Yeah, in the best kind of way, he's he's typecast. Yeah, he um he is, is, is just the the cynicism and the uh, kind of the I guess weariness with life when we first meet his character Rick. Uh, he just, he, he's only in it for himself. Um, and you know, you can see this kind of character, uh, crop up again in various different films that were inspired in part by Casablanca. Like I'm thinking specifically of like Indiana Jones, um, huge inspirations from Rick, uh, among other, among other characters, uh, kind of this anti-hero uh, uh, like reluctant hero. Yeah, he doesn't want to be the hero. Absolutely, he doesn't, he doesn't want to. He just wants to run his little cafe and be left alone. His, his gin joint. And speaking of gin joints, we should say anyone that is watching that has not seen Casablanca has heard many quotes from this movie. That is true. Uh, it's it's probably the mo one of the most quotable movies of all time, and so many lines are extremely iconic. That like yeah. when I watched it for the first time, I, I was just thinking to myself like, that's from this movie. Like I like I had heard so many of the lines, or it spoofed so many times in other movies. Uh, yeah, but you definitely heard them, and yeah, there's so so many iconic lines in this movie that uh, that don't don't disappoint. Uh, yeah, I mean, play it again, Sam. Uh, here's looking uh, at you, kid. Here's looking at you, kid. Louie, I think this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship. Um, and all the gin joints in all the world, she stumbled yeah. on the line. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's so quotable. Uh, I, I would, I would love to own the screenplay to this, uh, to this movie. 
that's, that's that would be that would be a very cool collector's item. Yes, a screenplay. Um, one thing I wanted to mention about how this movie was made, um. According to the Wikipedia, it says the film was based on Murray Bennett and Joan Allison's unproduced play, Everybody Comes to Rick's. Uh, the Warner Brothers story analyst who read the play, Stephen Kernot, called it improvingly sophisticated hokum. And story editor Irene Diamond, who discovered the script on a trip to New York in 1941, convinced Hal Wallace to buy the rights in January 1942 for $20,000 the most anyone in Hollywood had ever paid for an unproduced play. Um, this movie was originally not, we were just talking about making a movie to become a best picture film. This movie came out of nowhere to win best picture. Oh, absolutely. Uh, it was, you know, it was shot uh, in not too long. Uh, I mean, it was a lot of money to secure the, script as i just mentioned but uh the budget itself was not much um well and we should say on top of that it's pretty obvious when you watch the movie how the budget was so little because it takes place in like two spots yes in in his gin joint which is also his house upstairs essentially and which is so cool yeah absolutely and then in uh, of another apartment so it, i mean it's pretty much just that and in the streets of morocco as well i suppose but that's even pretty limited yeah uh and i think that that opening i don't want to say scene because it's 40 minutes uh the opening i suppose collection of scenes where they're just uh kind of bouncing around rooms in the in in his bar or cafe with the music playing and things are happening is it, is so good you forget that you're you almost forget that you're watching a movie uh yes. because it's it's 40 minutes 45 minutes in before like they go to a different location and then you think you're so, like holy crap we just spent 45 minutes in one location and i didn't even feel a minute of it yeah which is yeah which is the genius behind behind it the other the other thing specifically relating to that opening 40 minutes is this the character development that occurs in that time? Um, so many characters are introduced in the most believable of ways in that opening forty minutes, and all it takes is like a little conversation from each. Because uh, you know Rick is bouncing around; he's doing a bunch of stuff. Uh, people are chatting amongst each other. And we can learn of this giant ensemble cast. Um, uh, Captain Louis, uh, Major Heinrich, uh, Senior uh, Faré, uh, Senior Augarte, uh, the pickpocket, Sasha, all these people uh, that just kind of end up hanging up at hanging out at Rick's American. Um, we we learn so much about in the most efficient way. It's just very efficient storytelling. Absolutely, I think, uh, and that's that's the beauty of it. Of it is even in a relatively short movie, and especially that that opening, you feel like you know all the characters too. I mean, much less introducing them well, you get to know what their characters are like or their personalities at least. Uh, so you can which helps for later plot points to know like, okay, who's this character and what are they about? Because exactly. it's set up so well. Exactly. And that you almost don't need any exposition because, or you don't really need me to, t you don't need to tell me that that guy is a Nazi because I, I, I can tell just by the way he talks and, and things like yeah. that. It's set up so well. It's all it's all showing and no telling. Um, Agreed. Which which is what we like to see. Which is, I mean, I hope anyone likes to see that. I mean, that's just it's just believable. Uh, it's just believable storytelling. It's a it's it's a realistic movie. Um, and I think that's the genius of the writing and, and directing combination. Exactly. Yeah, I would I would I would agree with that. Um, yeah. 
I do want to ask you, what's your overall uh, thoughts on the plot itself? How does that, how does it progress? And it's, it's a, it's a beautiful, it's a beautifully laid out plot because as we mentioned, we, we got the opening 40 minutes where we kind of get exposition, but without a narrator, we figure, we, we piece together some exposition ourselves as an audience. And then things get complicated in the middle. And then there's a whole flashback sequence that is wonderfully done uh, between our two leads. And that, again, shows instead of tells their relationship. Like yeah. there's no moment where Rick sits down and tells the whole story to someone. Uh, we're, we're shown it, which um, we might have talked about this with, uh, with Citizen Kane I don't know if we've ever talked about Citizen Kane on here um, at all. I don't know either. Citizen Kane is a uh, very similar. Citizen Kane came out the year before. It's 1941, 1942. But uh, again, we talk about the uh, non-linear uh, story storytelling style uh, plot structure, non-linear. Yeah. Um, and uh, both of these movies were trailblazers in terms of um, having that non-linear narrative. Citizen Kane is a little more scattered, a little more ambitious perhaps, but Casablanca has this uh, flashback in the middle of it, which to my knowledge, I've never seen a, a film that came out before that that, uh, that did that sort of thing. I don't think so, yeah. Um, you know, very, very bold. Um, I, yeah, I think that's... That's the whole thing is they were willing to take chances and the, those risks paid off uh, ultimately, which I think is why it's aged so well too is because it's able to do what feels like modern techniques all the way back in 1942, yep. you know, which is why most movies don't age that well is because movie making has changed so much, but the, they were about almost ahead of the curve, yes. which is even, I should say is even more uh, impressive that it won Best Picture uh, because people might not ha or been taken aback or uh, couldn't follow it or something like that because it was different. It was so different than what was being made at the time. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know. I just can't imagine walking into the theater at, in, in, in 1942 and uh, watching this because um, – if you think about growing up at that time, I would have thought that you would have some kind of, you wouldn't have exposure to the kind of movies that we do now. Um, and we, you wouldn't have that kind of exposure to seeing a truly well done film like this. Yeah, I'm sure. You know, I'm sure they exist, but um, it's got to, it, it would have had to be a bizarre feeling. You know, absolutely, and it, and it's interesting that the subject matter of this movie, of course, taking place in World War II, while coming out in World War II. I mean, how does how do you think that would have been like in 1942, seeing a movie about World War II while you're living through it? Yeah, it would have to be. I mean, um, very timely too. That's yeah. the crazy part. That, that that is a good point because. Um, you see a lot of movies that come out today that can be considered very timely. Um, I'm thinking specifically of something like uh, Bombshell that came out last year. That is incredibly timely. Um, made uh, made right now, uh, firmly placed in current events, um, as in the last few years. But man. Is Bombshell going to age like Casablanca does? In, probably, in probably better to be honest. Eighty years. I mean, Charlie Theron, but I, I you know, you yeah. know what I mean. Like, yeah, absolutely. To be able to make a movie about World War II, well, inside World War II, like you don't have the benefit of retrospection. No, like you don't. Steven Spielberg did when he made Saving Private Ryan or Schindler's List. Uh, you have no idea how. Audiences are going to view this movie in 80 years. 
or or really even in present day too some people might be offended that there's a war going on and we're making a movie about it. you know that type of thing yeah, yeah so it's really daring in that way as well in both of those ways which I, yeah i i honestly had not considered that point tonight uh, which before now which speaks to how, how really great this movie is that is able to like you said without any knowledge of how this this world war ii would age or how how this making war movies would age uh to go out and do this is quite impressive. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, uh, on the same note, um, although an initial release date was anticipated for early 1943, the film premiered at the Hollywood Theater in New York City on November 26, 1942, to coincide with the Allied invasion of North Africa and the capture of Casablanca. So uh, that I hadn't read that until right now, but that's crazy i did not know that that's funny um it went on into general release on january 23rd 1943 to take advantage of the casablanca conference a high level meeting in the city between british prime minister winston churchill and american president franklin d roosevelt uh the office of war information uh prevented screening of the film to troops in north africa believing it would cause resentment against uh vici supporters in the region so that's funny. Um, so yeah, like you just said, Will, like 30 seconds ago, extremely timely. And, you know, there was the possibility of offending somebody yeah. uh, back in those days. So that's ambitious in that, in that arena as well. And uh, before we conclude, I, I do want to talk about the ending a little bit. How, how, does, that, how does that ending of uh bogart and his new friend how does that you think uh relate to what was going on are we, are we just all about happy endings in the 40s because it seemed it seems a little cheesy but it's still it still works so well i think it's perfect yeah i, I think it's a perfect ending um and maybe I, not maybe not today maybe not tomorrow but soon and for the rest of your life uh, uh perfect and, and you know it it i'm sure all the like all movies before this and the the early disney movies all like the the love story always happens and and, th and in this case it doesn't too which is which is kind of uh i'm sure was different at the time as well so yeah it's it's, it's good to see a movie that defies your expectations and this one definitely does exactly definitely does do that and we we should mention like the the production design of the whole cafe is fantastic and the cinematography is great. And I mean, technically this movie is extremely sound. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, incredible film, incredible film. Uh, should we, should we, should we give it a rating real quick? Yeah, let's do it. But bef before, actually just real quick before that, where, where would this fall? uh in your like is this top 50 top 20 what what is this for you i'm just curious oh this is this is top 15 it's been um it's been a, it's it's been a number nine before my number nine is uh notoriously fluid. yeah versatile fluid yeah so um interesting yeah man okay uh it's there somewhere where is it for you is it it's not in your top 10 is it it is not it's uh it's number 22 but, okay. Uh, okay. Wow. That, that's very high, though. That is quite high. You've yeah. seen a lot of movies. I have seen uh, a fair amount. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> let's, uh, let's talk, uh, or let's uh, let's give a star rating. Um, I'll uh, you go first. I'll give it uh, four and a half out of five. Which, again, uh, four and a half is considered a masterpiece, no doubt. And um, I've only seen like eight movies I consider five stars, but. Again, I would consider Casablanca a perfect movie. It's just not one of my uh, my absolute favorites, but top fifteen, undoubtedly. And Will, what 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 are you going to give Casablanca? Four and a half as well. I took the words right right out of my mouth. Uh, great, great movie. Uh, actually, before we, I do want. Is there anything you would change about this movie? Anything? <laughs> is there anything at all? For me, there is nothing. Like, legitimately nothing. I, 
I don't think I could do that. Like I, I would, I would feel like I'm playing God or something. You know? <laughs> sure. Like I feel like there'd be something ethically wrong about changing Casablanca. I I wouldn't want to, and there's nothing in it that I find distasteful. I I think this is a perfect movie. Agreed. Mm. But uh, so a couple four and a halfs. There we go. That see. If we do these retrospectives, you're gonna you're gonna hear more higher ratings. You're gonna you're gonna yeah yeah you're gonna hear a lot of well, there's not a whole lot of movies we consider perfect. Um, Agreed. Yeah. So. So. Yeah. Didn't one like Casablanca? Casablanca. Oh, I couldn't speak there for a second. Uh, is a uh, it's a treat, really. Absolute treat. But Absolutely. uh, should we hit uh, recommendation before we get out of here? Yeah, let's do it. Do you, uh, do you want to go first or should I start us off? I'll actually go first. I got something. I thought right. of something. Let's hear it. Let's we're, hear it. We're, we're talking um, earlier in the episode about Sherlock Holmes. Big Sherlock Holmes fan. A um, lot of great original short stories from Sherlock Holmes. You can pick up a collection of those for like probably five bucks, like compilation of original short stories. Uh, my favorite of them is uh, The Speckled Band, uh, originally written by Arthur Conan Doyle. Uh, early on, really early on, but just great literature. Pretty easy to follow. Yeah, published in 1892, but really easy to follow for 19th century literature. Uh, check out The Speckled Band. And uh, Will, how about you? Well, that's a good recommend. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to recommend a person, uh, that person being Wes Anderson. Okay. Okay. Uh, I recently revisited my favorite movie of his, The Grand Budapest Hotel, and I'm uh, gonna sit down and watch the rest of his filmography in the next in the next week or two here. Um, and if you if you're looking for just some fun movies, he he's the he's the director to watch. Uh, j- just it's it's he's so entertaining because he's so different, you know, his color palette and his his quirky characters and his his stylistic decisions of how he moves the camera and where he places thing it, it, it's just so beautiful to watch and they're just they're just fun they're fun movies uh symmetry symmetry yeah he loves him some symmetry uh so yeah i'm gonna recommend wes anderson for everyone out there but until next time sam where can i find you on uh, on letterboxd find me on letterboxd.com slash S.J. Deerberger. And where can I find you, Will? You can find me at Will Spalding on Letterboxd. And uh, you can find us in Morocco, specifically Casablanca, specifically the gin joint that uh, Humphrey Bogart used to own. But, it's, still uh, occupy- it's still occupied by Nazis. We still have to look out for those guys. Yeah, so. you, you got to watch out, obviously. Uh, but if you're not in the continent of Africa, uh, you can <laughs> find us... Uh, at Those Film Nerds on any podcast platform as well as YouTube or uh, anchor.fm slash Those Film Nerds where you can find all of our uh, episodes or Those Film Nerds on uh, Instagram or reach out to us at thosefilmnerds at gmail.com with anything movie related. And until next time, Sam. Keep watching movies, everyone. Have a great week. There we go. Bye, everyone. Thank you for listening.